description? I can see, yep, a book of beads, yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to today's Creative Conversations of Bouclé Women. My name is Elizabeth Palmer. I am an educator at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. With me today is Bev Gibson, co-founder of the Abouglé Women community. Before I start, I not only want to thank Bev for being with us today, but also thank her for helping put this exhibition together and being a wonderful resource these past few months and learning about this group of wonderfully creative women. And also, they're very inspiring too. So thank you, Bev. Um, I hope we can share this exhibition with you, the public, soon. In the meantime, I thank you for watching this conversation, and I hope you visit our website to see exhibition photos, and please visit the Abouglé Beads website and their Instagram if you have it. I also want to thank the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, D.C., curator James Green, who helped Bev Gibson put this um, exhibition together, and international arts and artists for developing and organizing the exhibition. Thank you to our sponsors, Laura and Baron Harmon, and co-sponsors, Linda and Sanders Benquist. So with that, let's start, shall we? So, Bev, thank you again for joining me um, from your home in South Africa. I know it's um, getting into the evening there. And so to start, I'd like to hear more about how Obukle started, um, how you got involved, why you felt it was important to you. Um, and I wanted to show this portrait of you and Induna, you, you know, the two, the two founders. Yes. Um, okay, so the first question is, uh, sorry, um, yes. there's so much to tell you, so to just maybe go through each point yeah. um, at the time, or do you yeah, so I, do you, however we want, I, maybe how it started, how, it, okay. how you got involved. Right. Okay, perfect. So um, um, I was living on a um, sugarcane farm in, on the North Coast, and I had been involved in certain projects with rural women. And my son, Matthew, introduced me to Nduna, who was at that time doing beadwork for a person in Durban, which is a city quite close to where I lived, and being paid an absolute pittance. And she and I decided to start the business. Um, to take it back a step, I suppose the cane is cut by people from the Transcar, and the cane cutters come, it's about an eight hour trip from where they live to the sugarcane plantation. And because there was no work for the women, often the men would come on their own and then go back for Christmas and when the cane cutting season was over. And the question was, why don't the women come and simply because they could not afford to. So their idea was to create employment so that the women could then have a choice of coming or not with their husbands, depending on how nice he was being, of course. But it was, you know, that sort of, sort of feeling, if you want to come, the choice is now yours. We will try and find work for you. He's got a place that he can live, you can live with him. And so we, we literally started under a tree in the garden making serviette rings and scrunchies for your hair and um, then developed it into necklaces. And we started selling just through friends. And um, it, what was always so incredible about Induna was that she would only accept the best. So if anybody started something and it wasn't good enough, she would break the necklace or break the serviette ring into the spill of beads. And we soon got a reputation for making stuff of incredibly high quality. But also, what was fantastic about her is so often you see the traditional African beadwork, as they call it. And this wasn't traditional. It was something that was contemporary. It was vibrant. It was fun. And for me, from the beginning, that message was so important. African women love different things. They love different art. They love contemporary design. Yes, they also love traditional design. And you can see that in their art where some of them, such as Bongiswa, had a huge hankering over the past and would include a lot of quite traditional motives in her work. Whereas somebody such as Zandile is really modern and 
you can see that in her work, the, the vibrancy, the colors, um, there's very little um, emblems from, from traditional work. And um, we just grew from there. We, we, you know, eventually we had 30 women under the tree. We then renovated an old outside room. And at one stage there were 170 women beading. Um, and then it, uh, my circumstances then changed. Sorry, um, there we go. Master, sorry, that was a call trying to come through. Yeah, okay. <laughs> circumstances change and I moved to the Natal Midlands. And with that, I woke up the one morning and in Duna and 10 of the beaters had arrived and we basically all slept on the floor of this house that we were renovating. And we then started a shop on the Midlands Neander, which is a tourist group route. And from that, we became known um, and it just, you know, grew and grew. But it was always the, the, the whole part of a bochle that people often miss is that it is the women, it is their art, it is their project. They're not only the makers, they're also the designers. And um, my role is that I work, I now work for their marketing. And it's a, it's a great change because they know it's a, it's a very... For me, it has liberated them in the sense that they know that should they ever not want me to market their work, they can then choose to employ somebody else to do it for them. But this is very much theirs. Excellent. So I want to go back a little bit because I had no idea the group was so big. 170 women, you said, I think. Um, that's, that's incredible. How did you... How did word get out? Was it just friends coming, sisters coming? How did yes? Yeah, so, in a country with massive unemployment, so before COVID, our unemployment was sort of um, probably at about um, 28 30 percent. Wow. With COVID, we're probably going to look at about a 50 percent unemployment, and it would have just gone through the grapevine, you know, as people. Um, would have heard about it. What happened, and you know, we, we talk about different things in every meeting, and you know, you sometimes there is, you know, you forget details, and there is so much to tell. But because it was always the women's work and their role, there was no contract in place. People would come, um, clients would come to a bochle, they would see what we were doing, and then they would entice the women to leave. A group of women and say, I will, please will you come and do this work for me and I will pay you more. And when that group of women left, um, we didn't, it, 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 it's, we almost made the, the decision in Duna and I that that door then closed. You could leave of your own free will, but you couldn't come back. And the reason being is because we run it as a business. We don't get any grants. We don't receive any funding. So we depend entirely on sales. And for people to go to a client, the client was obviously going to cut all the costs that they would be paying us, but it wasn't sustainable. And once they'd finished that beading order, they would close. Mm -hmm. And so the next one would happen. And that is, there was a, a huge split in 2008 where 10 women just re remained because people, you know, tasked them with these huge offers. The sadness for me is none of those projects are still going, but it, it just gives you an indication of what can happen. Yeah. Well, um, so how many women are with the group now? And now there are a five women. Okay. And so those are the five yeah. women that are in the exhibition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have portraits coming up of them. Yes. Can I just break at the women, right? There are five women yes. currently. So what happened was when the big split, there were 10 women mm -hmm. that stayed at a bochle um, and shared a little farm and we just continued as we had before. But those, five of those women then very sadly passed away. Um, people always mention HIV, but um, cancer and sugar diabetes, high blood pressure, TB 
are all other illnesses that rural people die of. It's not only HIV, and we also don't call ourselves an AIDS project. We're aware of AIDS, we educate, you know, with the young children now, you tell them about AIDS, but we definitely don't call ourselves an AIDS project. I know, I know that comes up frequently, but um, before I get ahead of um, myself, um, <laughs> do you, um, have you and Anduna, have you talked about inviting more women? Um, is there a process that you, you two have? Um, are you, or are you even looking at that right now? I don't, with COVID, it's very special. So I don't know if that's impacted your plans at all. Okay, so I think, you know, to realize that in the group, that the 10 women, they stayed because they were the ones that were the most talented. Um, they were the artists and they stayed because they wanted to be recognized as artists rather than the other quite lucrative opportunities that had been offered. And so when you, you know, to invite other people, it's, it wouldn't just be saying to a person, can you stitch beads onto fabric? It had to be more, more than that, people who understood and who were artists. And it's, it's taken, when you look at the women's early work and you look at their later work and you see the way in which they've progressed, but for somebody to come in and start, they would have to go through what has been sort of 18 years of these women honing their skills and educating themselves, reading books, looking at art, going to art exhibitions. So we would be very nervous of somebody coming into the group. And, but in saying that, we are also looking at the children. So Sandile and Tando and Zondlile are all teaching their children to bead and to create works. And the other thing, which I know it's, it sort of gets down to finance at the moment, we have enough money um, through our savings to keep going through COVID, even if we don't do any sales. And COVID has hit our sales really hard because at the opening of each exhibition, we would have an evening where work was available, all the necklaces and jewelry would be available and people would buy them. So we would be very, very nervous of people coming in and taking on that responsibility. And, you know, we are so proud to say that during this COVID time, we haven't accepted any government grants, any government funding, any help whatsoever. We've kept going simply through our savings. And for that, it is unbelievably empowering because you've seen businesses close every day. And if we can get through this time, just completely reliant on what we have built up, it, it, it'll be it'll be quite an achievement for all oh, of us. Absolutely, that it's an inspiration. Um, I mean, I, I said it earlier, just like the women, just their outlook and the art is so inspiring. But just the business itself is also inspiring. And I love the idea of teaching the children, um, you know, this craft. It reminds me of the quilters that we have in the American South of they don't go to school, they, you know, they picked it up from their mothers and their grandmothers and their aunts, um, and they teach their children, um, and they pass it along that way. Um, so I think that's a really, I think that's really lovely. I like that, I like that a lot. Um, and I like the comparison there. Um, so speaking of the women, um, here they are. Um, for those of you at home who um, who were unable to see their portraits clearly during the gallery talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, these are the five women who are still part of a, bu a boucle today. Um, and there are others in the, um, the exhibition who have passed and we will um, talk a little bit about um, that when we get to the themes. Um, but we do have these portraits displayed in the galleries to, um, you know, spotlight these women and as artists. And so with this exhibition, um, well, it has, you know, in a way elevated the status of them as artists. Um, can you tell us about how the exhibition started, how that process 
came about? Yes. Um, what had happened was, we mentioned very briefly about the attack on Little Farm in 2008. And, um, you know, at that time where there was this major split in the, um, in the group and a whole lot of the artists left and went to a, um, another group. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay. And, um, okay, so what happened then is that we decided to keep quite a low profile in South Africa. And we had been introduced to a person who had opened an art gallery in New York. And he had had an exhibition of our work and Lowry Sims from MAD, Museum of Art and Design in Columbus Circle, had seen the exhibition and she had included a couple of the pieces in a project that she was called for Global Projects. And I went across to New York and as South Africans do bummed a couch of somebody to sleep on and then went and, and saw Lowry and said to her, Lowry, what do we do? And she was incredible. She said to me, I really think this is the only art coming out of Africa at the moment. It's, it's incredible. It's new. It's exciting. It's beautiful. Um, you can see that it's, it's, you know, the recognition of the maker as the artist. It, it was something that she was, you know, really excited about. And the fact that these, you were, in looking at the Ndwango, you were recognizing that people will use whatever is available to them to create art don't have to go to university to be taught to paint or that this is considered a medium and that isn't. And suddenly beading was considered and, and recognized as being a medium through which somebody could express their artistic ability. And I mean, it was, I was sitting in our office and I said, okay, Larry, where, where should this step be? And she said to me, the Smithsonian in Washington. So I said, great. And my daughter was with me. Um, it had been her 16th birthday and everybody had sort of chipped in to pay her a ticket. So I had to share my couch with my daughter. But we had a car and we, we drove to um, Washington, which was a whole complete adventure on its own. And I went to the um, African Art Gallery and met with Dr. Jeanette Cole, who just happened to be there that day. And I had these three little pieces rolled up in my handbag. You've actually got one of them as the sample, the very long, thin pieces, one of the pieces that we actually showed to Dr. Cole. And she made time for me. I mean, it was really knocking on her door. There was no introduction. And I said, Larry Sims has sent me. And she looked at this, the work and she said, I, I want this. And then when we looked at the African crucifixion and saw how big it was, it wouldn't fit in her gallery. So then she sent me across to the Anacostia, which was a whole nother adventure. Hello. And, um, we then worked on it. An amazing woman called Portia James, who so sadly died of cancer. And she was at the museum and we worked under her. Um, and she was incredible. I mean, so much of what, what you see is, you know, Portia's influence. Oh, wow. And it, so, and, so it's really just, you know, this amazing team coming together. Um, the Smithsonian, what, a, what an opportunity to work with them. What did you and the women have to do in preparation? Like what was, because African crucifixion was finished already. Were there, um, were there other pieces that were finished or was it um, a combination of finished and then pieces that they worked on? What in the exhibition? We'd had a couple of people in South Africa who had started collecting the work. And, um, I, you know, I sort of approached them and said to them, please, can we borrow these pieces back for the exhibition? And not only have you paid a lot of money for your work, but you're now going to give it back to us and probably not see the piece for five years. It was that sort of conversation happening. And everybody was great. You know, if it can promote these women, we will certainly, you can use the pieces with pleasure. And then the challenge was that they wanted a herd of cattle for all the um, reasons discussed um, in the exhibition, the, the importance of cattle to the women, the importance of cattle in South Africa. It was something that everybody could relate to. And so the women worked on the cattle that you'll see in the exhibition. And they worked on this between 10 months to a year, depending who the beater was. 
each beater working on their own piece. And um, what was fantastic about that is that it also showed how each woman was given the same inspiration, um, worked the same material, and yet each animal and each artwork is so different from the others. And that was important for us showing that these women, it, it was sort of what is the difference between craft and art? And it was that each one was, you know, something designed incredibly beautiful by each individual artist. Absolutely. And you know, talking about one of those areas, the bulls, um, the exhibition is laid out into sections. We have a section to the bulls and we have a section remembering those lost um, from those illnesses. Um, at, the, at our museum, we have two galleries dedicated to um, a book late a day and then a gallery for the bulls. And then we have the African crucifixion up there. Um, how did, so you, you did talk a little bit about the bulls, um, how that came about, but what were, what was the process of choosing the other themes for the exhibition? So it, what it was, was looking at work that was available, um, sending photographs to Portia Sharon Rankins, who was also incredible, um, James and myself, and selecting the pieces that had been offered back to us from collectors and which pieces would be going into the exhibition. And, you know, um, yes, why they went in, why some pieces were chosen. Some pieces, they were all chosen, first of all, because of their merit. They were just extraordinary pieces, each one of them. And then secondly, when you came to choosing Induna's work, because every piece Induna produces is just so extraordinary. We, you know, we chose the ones with these incredible stories that were behind them, like my sister, my see my tears, because it showed her dedication um, to this, which people often don't credit African people with. You know, we, we, we so, in our travel, you know, you so often said African time, you know, and the questions that you are asked about being an African, it's, um, it was it was wonderful to show that we were businesslike. We understood the importance of completing these pieces, um, and and I, yeah, and I think that was in, incredible to give us credibility as a serious business, in spite of all the trauma that we faced. Absolutely, um, and I love how you know the pieces in the exhibition and. Um, for those of you who are unable to join us for that gallery talk, um, it's on Facebook and YouTube. So you're welcome to go back and hear those stories, those personal stories um, that are behind these stunning pieces. And I think that's what I really love about them is that they are so personal to each artist. They do have, you know, their own own style and their own story. Um, even the bulls, where while it's the same subject, they're they're very different and they mean something different to each of the women. And I love that. Um, so I think um, I do have. I know some people want to see the work, and I do have a video of I believe it's in Duna, working on um, a piece. Um, this is the next slide and I want to try and play it for X, try and play it and you can see how tiny those beads are and just how precise her her stitching is it's so quick to pick up those beads oh my gosh it's just a short clip but um you sent me since we've been in contact for the past couple of months and you've sent me video after video and i i could watch the videos just and be mesmerized by it because they're so quick and the the beads are so so small uh and how they you know how they're able to produce these and i do have um some questions um since this, this is pre-recorded i asked a group to, um, to submit questions. So are all of the beads glass? Do the women make any of the beads or are they purchased? Just to, sorry, just to 
take one thing back to the build because it's yeah. always and it shows how we caught up even a women's group it's caught up in, in language where two of the bulls are actually female and <laughs> sorry 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 <laughs> we called it james Porsche and i called it the bulls and <laughs> the cattle and it's it's always hysterical because you don't say anything and then somebody will notice and they'll say to me but doesn't that bull have an udder and then we say well actually two of them are female so the one with the very big horns the encoli bartando is a female and um the other female is the piece uh, um so it was just important to you know to show that but anyway sorry to press we will call them the cattle then going forward. <laughs> I feel so sad for those female bulls. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, just, and, and the fact that the one with the biggest horns is actually the most, you, you, know, you can see without a doubt that it's a female because she's got another. You know? right. <laughs> so, the, the beads are all glass. Um, what um, people don't know is that glass beads are traded very early in our country for different commodities, for land, for food brought in by the traders coming in from Europe. And it was one thing that had huge value to the people before they would have used seeds mm -hmm. and made clay beads. And suddenly there were these beautiful beads, shiny, sparkly. And Induna will only work with the Czech beads and then with the Mayuki beads. She won't work with the Chinese beads um, simply because they're not as regular, they're uneven and um, they're not of the same quality. So the beads we use are the very expensive beads. At one stage we did make, we were given equipment and we started melting um, glass and making our own beads. And um, very sadly, when we had the attack on Little Farm in 2008, they stole all that equipment. But it, it was making large beads. We really used it for the jewelry. We didn't use it on the Ndwangos. You know, you've, you've got centuries of people knowing how to make these beads in, you know, in Europe. It's, you, you, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. Um, right. so, yeah. Well, I, the end product is definitely worth it. It's so beautiful. And yeah, I guess when you do have a, a store that's already doing it for so long, why, you know? Why, why do it yourself? With that. Yeah. I mean, if you uh, go to the Republic and you see all their crystal and you see all their glass and that is what they're famous for and basically that is what we're doing we can use two jewels onto fabric creating an artwork mm -hmm. and that, that is part of what makes it so astonishingly beautiful yeah. and it's worth it absolutely yeah. worth it um, do the women sketch their designs before beginning to sew the beads on the black fabric Okay. So in the beginning, very few of the beaders that are with us now sketched. And in an interview that Induna did at the Korea Museum, which is actually great, and I think it's still on their website, where she says, I do not use chalk. And what she means by that is that on the back black fabric, they would often, they would draw their border with chalk and they do their border first. And then what they would do is ask one of their children to draw the outline of an animal because they weren't confident enough in the beginning to believe that they could do the outline of the, the cattle, say. And what would be hysterically funny, as you can imagine, after three days that outline had gone. But it just gave them the reassurance, reassurance that they had this, the um, proportions correct. They don't now, you know, the pieces that you see, um, there was one that Zandile called, I'm a beautiful, sexy woman. And it was of a female cow. And it was the most gorgeous piece. I'm always so sad that we sold it because it's this pink cow and it's sort of, you know, slightly Picasso-like and that it's not perfect. And it's looking over its shoulder, but the whole animal just shows you that attitude. And she got that right because she beaded it from start to finish. She didn't draw an outline. And, and that is what, you know, that they're, that they are doing now. Um, the very abstract pieces, there's definitely no drawing involved. If somebody asks them for something, so for instance, if you ask them to 
um, feed your dog. So we've, we've actually been doing this whole thing on dogs at the moment. And to get, when somebody, if you've got a, um, a Labrador, you'll know what your Labrador looks like. So when that is beaded as a portrait, you don't want it to just look like a Labrador, you want it to look like your Labrador. So what we then do is we take a photograph, we look at anything that is different about this Labrador to other Labradors, and they will then do an outline in chalk, drawing that actual Labrador on the fabric. Got it. So it's specific. When it, when it needs to be specific, they'll, they'll draw like that. Yeah. Um, after um, the beads have been sewn, um, is the fabric stretched over a frame at all to keep yes. it? I know the work behind you seems to be in a frame. Yeah. Uh, um, do you want me to show you one? Uh, yeah, would that help? Sure, if you, if you can. Um, yes, I told them. So we are just waiting for Bev to bring us a piece to see how it is okay. it's sort of finished. For instance, this is a piece by Zondlile and it's actually called Innocence and it's the most gorgeous piece. Can you see it? A little bit if you, um, you, just if you move it and more in front of you maybe with the light. The lights on, sorry. I know, I know, I know you're having there we go. Oh, there you go. Um, if you have a look, is that better? Oh, yeah, that's stunning. So this piece was called Innocence, and I absolutely loved it, and I, I love cooking, and I had it in my kitchen for about three months before the one day I suddenly looked and realized there was a snake, you know, looking into the piece. And it's once again, it's, it shows the humor and the way that everything isn't obvious but so that is the piece in the front and then that is the back to show how you stretch it oh wow That's and then cool these little things would be you know pushed in if the fabric stretched and then you, you know to give you an example of where that this is the this is the work unstretched so this is one of the the, the border terriers that we did so that oh, is what it's um that's the back of the fabric Oh, cool. And then, can you see this? I mean, just to have a look, can you see how bejeweled it is? Um, it's really coming through, especially with the lights, you know, just reflecting off each bead. But these are tiny. These are 15 earth. You know, if you can have a look at that sort of beading and the size of the beads, it's yeah. absolutely tiny. These are the Miyuki 15 earth. And then just the way in which, they, they, you know, they work, it's... Uh, with flapjack, so this is a, a, a portrait of one of my dogs. Um, and just, you know, the expression that she's managed to get with these eyes, it's just gorgeous. And then, um, yep, all the detail which you can see. And then once this is stretched out, um, you will get the three-dimensional look of it. Oh. Does that make sense? So it would then go, if you've got that there, and you've got that, it would then go over a frame. Mm -hmm. but can you sort of see? Yeah. And this gets sent to professional. I once tried to do it and I would never try again. So if <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> it's very difficult. I don't know how they do it so beautifully, but then it gets stretched sort of like that. Magic. Oh, man, that, that's so pretty. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Here we go. I, don't, I never get phone calls and I thought I turned it all off. So that is <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I love it. Thank you very much. I, <laughs> and I do love that portrait of your dog. I think I, it was on Instagram, on the yeah. Abukle Beads Instagram. I want to show you a very big piece, which I thought I had here. But you just show you, hold on a minute. For instance, okay, so now you're getting a preview of a piece that we hadn't actually shown you. So oh. this, is, this is one of the new builds that has been done. And to just give you an idea, that is what it's like. And it's very heavy. That is, one of my, that is another one of the questions. Is how much on average um, does each, does a piece like that weigh? Let's weigh, I don't know, um, about... 
<laughs> probably <laughs> but i don't know um about 12 13 kilograms okay that's a good yes. arm workout there if you wanted it <laughs> <You're strong. laughs> you, yeah because you you're lifting those pieces all the time <laughs> imagine stretching this big bull and how it just you know makes it so different and how strong they are i mean you saw how i just carried that around yeah wrong because every bead is stitched on it's amazing amazing um Lovely. Well, thank you for sharing those. That was quite a lovely surprise. Um, I hope everyone at home enjoyed that as well. Um, wasn't expecting that. It's wonderful. Um, and so, and, and in this video too that I showed, that's a piece that Induna is currently working or was currently working on um, when you sent it. And um, let's see. Had a, a different piece. She's called it, believe it or not, Corona. And what <laughs> she's, <laughs> you'll see it on our website. It's got all these funny things coming in from the side. And then she's done a shield, but she's done it really embossed and beautiful in the middle with these sort of things trying to come in, but that whole thing of being protected from COVID. Oh, and, I love know, it. And okay. they've been unbelievable, the women, in wearing their masks, sanitizing, staying at home. You know, they, they really have. Mm -hmm. and it's um it's a different piece but anyway it's yeah. <laughs> it's just so relevant of the time which just also makes it very special in a way and i think maybe um in the video and we'll have videos shown on our instagram of the women working like this one and you can see in some of them that they are wearing the mask and they are being very good. And we appreciate that because we want them to continue creating and making beautiful works of art. And one of um, the next um, slide, I have two, I have three pieces, sorry. And two of which Jennifer and I didn't show during the gallery talk. And we thought it would be really wonderful to hear from you being such, you know, being the marketing um arm of and you know just working so closely with the women and then we have one that i've chosen that we thought it would be really lovely to hear more from you about and so this next piece is funky bull which is in the remembering those lost section but connects to the cattle being respectful of that female um, and because it connects those two areas, I thought it would be good to include here. Um, and I did speak a little bit about this artist, Bongiswa, in our gallery talk. But as someone who knew her personally, um, can you tell us about her Bungiswa. and about this piece uh, that has such a fun title, A Bunky Bull? Mungisu was just absolutely amazing. She was Induna's sister, and they were incredibly close. And she was just the most delightful woman. Um, I think the funky bull shows her incredible zest for life. Um, you know, those eyes in the bull, which are just mesmerizing. And she loved Kadinsky. She, if I brought any books, any calendars, or anything on, on Kadinsky's work, she would grab them, you know, and they were hers. <laughs> and to understand some of the dynamics in our country is that if you're from the rural areas and you're illiterate and you um, don't have a formal education and you haven't really been exposed to the media that we have, quite, it was quite intimidating when they were first going out to functions and... Um, receptions where they were sort of the stars of the show and not really knowing what to wear um, and if they looked great or not. And Bongiswa always used the word funky. She had obviously heard it from her children and she didn't want to look smart or um, she wanted to look funky as, as an artist. And so whenever she you know, would dress up to go out, she would say to me, Bev, do I look funky? I'd say, yeah. You know, you, you're right on track. You look amazing, Bongiswa. 
So when she did this bill, she decided her bill also wanted to look all zhuzhi and funky. And so she called it Funky Bill. But what is, it's my favorite piece ever, this Funky Bill. And, and I, I, I don't know if it was because I just loved Bongiswa so much. But if you have a look at it and those circles, and when you see the actual piece and you realize that she didn't draw a single one of those circles. And if you look at the detail, and, and I, I would really ask you to photograph one of those circles and to put it onto Facebook or onto Instagram to show the way in which they are perfect. And, you know, just putting these all the way around this bowl, it, it was just incredible. And when you look at, um, I think in her work, thank you, or even in the bear shoe, you'll see how she started changing her circles and including different parts in it and developing her own style, but always using that circle. And just, and having a look at the bull, I mean, that was one of the inspirations of why the women also all did a bull. Oh, um, you know, this bull was done, you know, before was done in 2006 with the Bull and Exhibition was, those were done, I think in 2012, 2013. Okay. Well, yeah. Even be a better reason to have chosen it for this conversation. Go Jennifer and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will get, um, I will ask to get a picture of one of those circles and we'll show a close up of that on our Instagram. Cause I don't think, I mean, a picture just doesn't do it's they're pretty good representations, but they just don't do it a full justice on here to zoom in and get those close details. Well, I love this piece. We can we can come back to it if we want to. Um, the next piece I've chosen um, is this piece by Zondile, um, my mother's peach tree, and I chose it uh, because it is so bold and vibrant and that evoking the memory of, you know, this tree that her mother had. So just like um, with Funky Bull, can you tell us more about this and Zondile? She's also the only Zulu woman in the group, um, correct? The others are Kosa? Yes, that's Did I correct. say that right? <laughs> You've got to get you a bit of a click in, but it's great. But um, so, okay, we have a lot of fun, the five women and I, and we tease each other a lot. And in this, we've decided that if in a different life, Sondile would have been the archbishop, she would have been the Pope. She is the person who is deeply religious, very strict, um, dresses incredibly conservatively, um, strict mother, we, when you go to her, all her little beads on these beautiful little containers, and you, you know, you, you just, a life that when you look at her, you would imagine a sort of house that was gray and white, and then she just explodes with color in all her work. And we tease her and we say to her, that's your wild side coming out. And her love of color, so no matter how conservatively she is, she always has something pink, red, or orange on. And if you have a look at our website, we've changed our website completely and we've brought in all these beautiful colors with each artist choosing their favorite color. And what she says is that she loved her mom and in a place where she grew up where there was obviously poverty, she always has the memory of the peach tree and her mother used to sew, sit under the peach tree and she would sew. And it's very precious memories that she has. The way in which the peach tree would explode into color, fruit, um, just a very happy memory of her childhood. I love that. And you can definitely see that with all the, those happy, vibrant colors too. It's just exploding. You really yeah. get that. You're in that memory feel with her. Um, thank you. And so that leaves us to the African crucifixion here. And I'm 5'7", and just for scale, and I come up, if you can see my mouth, I think I come up to like right about there. And then each of those is a tiny, tiny little bead that you can't, you know, it's hard to get a really, you know, a, 
a detail that does it justice. Uh, so it's just an incredible, massive piece. And I wanted to come back to this piece. We did talk about it in the gallery. We ended on it um, with Jennifer. But coming back with you, because it was such a huge endeavor, it was a collaboration between the women, you know, both um, some of them that we've, you know, have lost to the illness, others that are today. So it's, you know, it's that memory too. And we do see some of those symbols of HIV and AIDS and they're just, you know, remembering how affected, I mean, not just your community of the Abukle women, but, you know, the broader um, community as well. So, and this was a huge commission for the women, right? And so I feel like that must have, um, in, in this journey, helped elevate them um, and confidence in their, their artist journey. Um, can you tell us about the commission, the design and the process that these women, how they came together to create this extraordinary piece? Um, we had done previous commissions, one of the, um, at the house in Durban, and we had done commissions for Anglo Gold and behind their boardroom in the Turbine Hall. So the women had worked on commissions before. And what had happened with this is that the very Reverend Fred Patu, who was then at the at a cathedral in Peter Maritzburg. Um, wanted to do something spectacular behind the pulpit. And he came and saw me. And we we decided, in Duna and I, we, we, we talked about this whole, because as you say, a mammoth undertaking, and where did you even start? And because it's so important that the beadwork is always the women, you couldn't draw something, you couldn't, um, you know, screen print the design. It, it, you had no idea what this piece was going to look like. And we started on the work and what we had done was that we took trees and you'll see them in the exhibit. One that Induna had done called the Tree of Life and one that Mungo China had done, which is a very stark tree, the peacock tree. And we, we put those on either side and then we did a mock-up of the crust. And then we used a piece by Ngoneni, um, who did the sky, she very sadly died. And we then, um, the beaters absolutely loved the Impressionists. So they, there was a lot of Van Gogh, they loved that. And there was a piece that had that sort of starry, starry nights in it. And we used that piece. And then Nontlaganipo, which is the one down with the little white house that she always had included in her work, we used a piece of hers and photographed it and sent this to the um, cathedral and said the piece will look something like this or not and I will never know the real reason why they pulled out of the commission but they did and there was an amazing person who had collected um, our work was never know if I'm allowed to mention his name or not because he's, he's private and when they pulled out I, I found him and I said to him you know we've really got to do this piece um, and he offered to share the cost. He and I then decided that the two of us would share the cost of producing this work because the fabric, the beads, the overheads, we were going to work on this piece for 10 months and have no other income. And it was just the most overpowering piece feeling that it was a piece that had to be created. And while the women were working on it, you know, there were so many stories that came in. So you, you had the idea of a tree theme. Tree of death becomes the tree of life and where hope is lost, so hope is restored. You have the sacrifice of Christ and you then have the women, as they're working on these pieces, feeding in their feeling of death, of life, of um, sacrifice. And the amazing thing about the Christ was Timbani worked on that. Timbani at this stage was she wasn't very ill, but she was, she was ill. And coming from the trans sky, she was living in a place where she, it wasn't her, her home. She felt very much um, like refugee. And 
she thought that she could relate to Christ in that way. When she first did Christ, she did him in black beads with a turban around his head, and she didn't like it, so she actually unpicked it because, you know, black, she said it, it was too dark. And so she used these incredible bronze beads. And if you have a look at her work, the Zulu dance, you'll see how she does these sort of tattoos. And she did a tattoo, sort of tattooed the crust as well. Um, and then she worked on his face. And she worked and worked and reworked that face. I, I was at times terrified that the, the fabric wasn't going to hold because she unpicked it so many times. And in the end, she creates this extraordinary expression of peace. And it was a crust, it was thin, he was mocked, but he had come for a purpose. And he fulfills the purpose and he therefore dies at peace. And that was her life. She felt the same and she felt that she could die at peace if she created this work so that she would be remembered as an incredible artist, rather than as somebody who didn't have a formal education, who came from poverty. It was, it was her purpose and her message to people. And that message of Tembani has been so incredible. Um, at some of the museums, we've worked with children who have felt that they have had no purpose and struggling with that. And I think mental illness amongst the young is such a huge issue nowadays. And when they look at these women who really would seem to have no hope and very little purpose, and then seeing what they've done in their beadwork and how they created this incredible stuff, they have felt so inspired. And that, that was Tembani's legacy. Within the crucifixion, of course, they tell the story of also our politics of a country with no hope, and then ending up at that stage, a country with incredible hope with Madiba, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and our first democratic election where the world watched and we thought that there would, might be a civil war and instead you had people queuing together to cast their votes, some people for the first time, and coining the phrase Archbishop Desmond Tutu of the rainbow nation. And there behind the Christ, you see the, the rainbow, um, showing that. But the tree of death, you know, going, showing a country with no help, hope, the vultures. Um, so Elizabeth, I don't know how much you've told of the story and if I need to give more details of each panel or, or not. We, gave, um, we identified each panel, um, but it's been a couple of weeks and some people may have not have watched. So just go right into it. Okay, great. So what happened was that you've got this, you know, vultures of society, the ribbons are orange. So it's not, it's breast cancer, it's um, prostate cancer, it's AIDS, it's, it's showing, you know, all disease that, that the um, people face. And then above this, you see this incredible storm um, brewing and the fear that the storm is going to bring destruction, lightning. And once again, looking at our time before the first democratic election of where the the violence in South Africa had reached horrific levels. Um, they look, it looked like a time of no hope, but we also all realized at that stage that it was a time that changes had to happen. Um, we were, I was at university at that time, and it, it really was a sort of thing that it's enough now, and there, there has to be a change. Apartheid needed to go. People needed the vote. Um, and then when you go down into the behind the crust, you'll see this very, very dark time. And that, of course, when you had the truth and reconciliation and you had people listening to what had actually happened. And, you know, there's that, that image of Archbishop Desmond Tutu actually putting his head on his hands and sobbing, realizing what had happened in this country. And it, ah, it, it, a terrible past. And then before the rain, in a typical South African way, you have the rainbow, this time of incredible hope. We could do no wrong. We had Madiba, we had shown the world how you can recover. You know, everybody loved us. And then once again, you have the tears, the crying as things come out, as they're not the way they should be. 
But once again, and drawing back to the truth and reconciliation, the importance of talking, of people, the whole thing about that process was the need for people who had gone through trauma, who had lost children, who had lost family members for political reasons. And the idea that the healing needs to happen because you needed to speak, you needed to share, that the person who had inflicted that needed to be forgiven and there needed to be a recognition. And, you, you know, we also, once again, when you talk to the children, when they come in, this thing of telling, if something terrible has happened to you, don't keep it inside, get it out, talk, because then there's the healing. And children love that, that the African masks crying and talking. But as they do that, they're filling the river that feeds the tree of life. And in the tree of life is everything as God intended it. You've got the birds, you've got trees, you've got, we call them millies, I think you call it corn, where you are, the chickens, um, and, and a, a life, yeah, the, the way it was intended to be if people live in harmony and with purpose. And even in that, the, the fun stories that Induna has um, included, some, she's put things called crayfish, um, you call them lobsters. And the first time that we were out, um, we were down the wild coast and we'd been invited to this dinner and there were these huge, big, bright red lobsters on the table and Duna hadn't seen one. And she looked at me and she asked me, she, is that a toy? And I said, no, it's a lobster. And ate, you know, ate it and absolutely loved it. And so she's included those. So she includes her part of what her life is about in there. And then of course, at the foot of the cross, you've got um, Mary and John and, once again, the um, in Christ dying moments where he instructs Mary to be the mother and John to be the son. And looking at that in a time where children are lost to illness, where children lose their parents to illness, and saying, you come in, you adopt, you keep the children within that's that, that community, that family. And in Duna, and the women, they look after the orphans. They look after Timbani's children and they look after Bungisu's children. And those children stay with their grandparents and that they get sent, they send them money back to pay for their school fees. And the most amazing thing about Zondlile, um, her sister was a woman called Ngoneni who died. Um, Ngoneni had introduced Zondlile to Bede. And I heard that Kevin Gunani's children had actually been to university. And this had all been done through, there is free education, but you do have to pay for your books and uniforms. And this had been something that Zondlile had helped her niece and nephew to do. And then of course, Nontlaganipo, um, including the little white house. And that is, shows the clinic. Um, so, in the very rural areas, they would still use mud to make mud bricks to build the house um, where that is showing the clinic. And if you look at the round um, houses in this picture, those would be um, your um, traditional houses. Um, sorry, my Mac's about to die. Let me just see. Um, obviously then the, the, the crust, you can't go back into the interview, okay. So then the crust is the final figure and the idea that I just shared it again. Yeah, I just shared it again. I'm still here. Okay, then, then the idea, of course, is that the Christ being the final figure and that the what happens story behind the, the Christ is that if you live a life of purpose and sacrifice, so this tree of death becomes a tree of life and hope. And the, and the sun rising above the Christ, you know, that's, yeah. It's a, it's a new beginning, it's a hope. And I, yeah. I, I, that's so inspiring and a wonderful message. And I think, you know, as we transition from this piece, I wanted to end here because it does end on like a future, a hopeful message. Um, even now, as we're going through a pandemic, um, how the Abukle women are today. Uh, and, you know, COVID has really pushed a global pause on everybody. 
and continues to keep us at home and our conversations you've shared about lockdowns and you know that happening and you know, sometimes that has kept you away from the women but how are you and the women doing during the pandemic in south africa if you'll just tell people at home who are watching this who are interested about you know how you're how you're coping in the pandemic um it's been an interesting time um for me this is the most that i've actually spent in south africa and with the women because with the exhibitions traveling i would go to each exhibition for them and um can you give me one minute sorry um, um to learn back okay so we decided that we were going to use the, sh the shutdown to learn to try new things um the at the beginning of the sh um, lockdown the women actually came and lived with me um at the farm and it was it was lovely it was um they brought with them 11 children and we did things like plant veggie gardens but we decided that we were going to, we were so much better off than others that we were going to try and get through this whole time without any reliance. And I, th I think the creativity, because there hasn't been that much pressure to produce work, they've been able to take time, try new forms. Um, their whole idea of looking at it as a very positive time um, and, and, you know, um, yeah, just, I mean, for me, the most wonderful thing was them coming. I'm an incredible dog lover, and I've got these three darling little border terriers. And the women loving those and then doing their portraits of these little dogs, but learning how you had to change things to give, you know, a different impact. And a time where, because there was so much sadness, to do things that made you laugh, made you happy. If you look at the colors that they've used in their work, it's all about being positive, knowing that it's going to, you're going to get through this. And, a, a, you know, a time where you, you've got to get through it, you've got to be wise, you've got to take care of yourself, but you can't be so scared of dying that you stop living. And that, for me, is, has shown them. They've gone back. Um, Induna had some very sad news during that first time. Her grandson died. And so they went back to be together together. Um, and once again, in Duna, dealing with that grief, dealing with that time, but still working, still creating this extraordinary work. I think so one, of my, one of my last questions, but I think you've kind of already answered that, and I'll give you a chance to maybe expand. What, and the message you hope visitors walk away with after seeing this exhibition, is it the positive, you know, just keep creating, keep going through, don't let death hold you back or you know whatever it is hold you back just keep creating and being I positive i think it's i mean when you think of it the five of us not one of us has an art degree and yet their work is in the most prestigious prestigious institutions in the world and to believe that you know to believe that everything is impossible until it's done we at such a bewildering time i mean for us the museums were critical to us and the people going because, as I mentioned to you earlier, people would go, they would commission works, they would buy the jewelry. That was our lifeline. That was our, you know, the blood and the way in which the American public just loved the Borghe, loved the women, loved the art. They embraced us. And our story went from hope to reality because of the way it was accepted in America. And suddenly now that has sort of changed and very different. So for us, we've had to believe our own message, that we don't give up, we keep being positive. And we've had two very exciting developments. So please look at our website and our Instagram, and we will tell you as soon as we are allowed to, and we'll publish that. But it's, if you can't give up, you know, you, you, you've just got to keep believing and living. And, yep, and hard work. <laughs> you've got to work oh, hard. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you um, for that. And I hope everybody at home takes that message. And I know it's been a while while we've been in lockdown, um, trying to get back to normal, but 
keep being positive, keep doing what you need to do. Um, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll make it through. It's hard work, but it's got to be done. Yeah. But, but um, Bev, thank you so much for sharing your story, a boucle story with me and the public today. Um, thank you at home for joining us. I hope everyone, as Bev says, please visit their website. It's a boucle beads. We'll put a link in the description. And if you're on Instagram, follow them. There are amazing behind the scenes with close-ups and videos, even the little dog portrait Bev showed earlier, that's on there so you can see it in its entirety. Um, so I hope everyone stays connected. I know I will continue to follow and stay connected to you, Bev, and the women. Um, I've just fallen in love with this work. I uh, just thank you so much for being with me today and for being a resource the last couple of months. And sorry about all the, the, the as I said, load shedding. It's a word that you Americans will now know when suddenly you have no power. <laughs> yes, it's been an educational day for us <laughs> all around. <laughs> well, thank you so much and um, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks.